America in the 1950s. This unit of the study will focus on the cultural aspects of the 1950s in the United States, as well as the foreign policy issues as we see the United States is fastly going away from the isolationist policies of the past and becoming the leader of the world. Moderate Republicanism, the Eisenhower years. Eisenhower's many supporters wore, I like Ike, hats, pins, and even nylon stockings, speaking to the powerful consumer culture's impact on politics. The Korean War and internal corruption in his administration had left Truman damaged, and Americans were longing for a change in leadership. And Truman would lose public support, and in 1952 decides not to run. The 22nd Amendment, ratified in 1951, limited the president to two terms and not more than 10 years in office. It exempted Truman because of ex post facto, being that the law was passed after the fact. The election of 1952. Democrats in Chicago. After Truman withdrew from having polled badly in the first Democratic primary on the third ballot, Governor Adlai E. Stevenson of Illinois, Truman's choice, was nominated and Senator John J. Sparkman of Alabama for vice president. Stevenson did not seek the nomination on the first to be drafted since 1880. Their platform endorsed the domestic and foreign policy of the new and fair deals and advocated repealing the Taft-Hartley Act and called for federal legislation to secure civil rights. For the Republicans meeting in Chicago, Senator Robert Taft of Ohio was an announced candidate, and when Eisenhower entered the race, the Taft camp saw evidence of Ike's infidelity while in his service. A letter from Eisenhower to Chief of Staff George C. Marshall indicated that he had an intended to divorce his wife and marry his British driver Kate Sotheby, but Marshall threatened to drive him out of the service if he did. Truman ordered Marshall to find and destroy the letter citing the belief that a candidate's personal affairs did not have a place in a presidential campaign. Eisenhower was nominated for president and to satisfy conservatives, young newly elected Senator Richard M. Nixon of California was nominated for vice president, having successfully painted himself as an anti-communist and prosecuting Alger Hiss. If you look at the little video to the left, this is the first televised political cartoon in U.S. history. During the campaign, the Republicans blasted Truman's stands on Korea and China and called for a balanced budget, reducing deficit spending, progressive tax relief, retention of the Taft-Hartley Act, and some kind of federal laws against unfair employment practices. After it was disclosed that Nixon benefited from a secret fund by a California businessman, Nixon would defend himself in an emotional televised checker speech on September 23rd. Eisenhower decided to keep him on the ticket. Republicans would successfully and painted Democrats as soft on communism, and voters responded by rejecting Truman's foreign policy, but not the New Deal. President Eisenhower Ike believed that the most important power of the president was not that of persuasion. While this has given him the appearance of a do-nothing president, recent scholarship has revealed that he played more of a role than that was thought of at the time. He appealed to middle-of-the-road voters. I call this domestic programs dynamic conservatism, and that it was conservative when spending money and liberal when it came to human beings. He kept the basic framework of the New Deal, but reduced many of the previous Democratic president's social programs, seeing no need for more reform. A key to Dwight Eisenhower's political success was his positive image with both liberals and conservatives. Eisenhower Interstate Highway System Transportation was revolutionized by the Federal Highway Act of 1956 that created a national system of interstate highways that provided federal funding to build a nationwide system of interstate and defensive highways that was the main purpose for defensive purposes. Eisenhower got the idea from the German Autobahn. The interstate highway system and construction of highways created jobs and stimulated economic growth especially as tourists and long-distance truck drivers traveled across the country. It helped increase demand for automobiles, steel, and construction industries. It was the only New Deal-style type of government of the Eisenhower administration of 41,000 miles, including 5,500 of urban freeways, projected costs of $26 billion in 13 years.
Four minority neighborhoods were often bulldozed for the interstate highway construction that also accelerated suburbanization. The car culture. The number and proportion of American families with automobiles grew in the 1950s. By 1955, about 90% of families in the United States owned at least one car, up from 60% in 1948. Fast food, motels, and other service industries grew as the middle class families took vacations they enabled by cars. The freedom and mobility associated with the car culture also helped making commuting easier, and white middle class families moved to the suburbs from the cities. The increased pollution caused by automobiles also impacted the environment. A people of plenty. Booming chain stores such as the Supergiant Supermarket shown here began to dot the suburbs in the 50s, offering an outlet for consumerism in the post-war years, especially in the new suburban areas. A brief post-war recession in 1945 to 1946 occurred while the economy shifted back to peacetime manufacturing, but a return to the Great Depression did not occur. In fact, the war had finally returned the United States to a vibrant economy with ever-increasing growth. After the wartime industrial boom came to a, a peaceful consumer boom, the money that people had saved or had been able un, to spend due to rationing now flooded the market, and the economy almost doubled in size by 1960. International monopoly due to Great Britain, France, Germany, and Japan being devastated by the war. The 1950s was also a decade that saw the birth of many successful franchises. McDonald's is one of the most well-known and successful franchises in the world. The fast food giant started as a single restaurant in California and now has over 38,000 locations nationwide. Holiday Inn. This hotel chain was founded in 1952 by Kevin Wilson and be quickly became a popular choice for travelers. Taco Bell, called Taco Tia, and this Mexican-inspired fast food chain was founded in 1954 by Glenn Bell. 7,000 locations are worldwide. There was also 7-Eleven, H&R Block, uh, founded in 1955 by Henry and Richard Block. H&R Block is a tax preparation company. It's grown to a global brand over 12,000 locations. And there's also Dunkin' Donuts, originally called Open Kettle. It was founded in 1950 in the Massachusetts and today is one of the largest coffee and donut shops with 12,000 locations in 36 countries. The consumer culture. Along with the post-war baby boom came a post-war construction boom. The number of American homeowners increased by 50% before 1960. And these new homes, new technology improved the average American's lifestyle. Items such as refrigerators, washing machines, and black and white televisions became common appliances. The availability of TVs in homes increased the opportunities for marketing, the commercials, which added to American desire to have the best and latest technology. For television in 1959, advertisement for TV dinners. As you can see here, the family eats out of disposable containers in front of the television. TV shows, movies, and plays in the 50s were outlets for homemakers' anxieties and fantasies. Leave it to Beaver was a popular comedy about a young boy and his happy-go-lucky family living in suburban America. Situation comedy television shows in the 1950s portrayed American families as white, polite, and happy, such as Father Knows Best, I Love Lucy, The Ozzie and Harriet Show, and of course, Leave It to Beaver. The GI Bill. The Servicemen and Adjustment Act of 1944, or the GI Bill, is one of the federal government's most successful public assisted programs. It guaranteed loans for buying houses, farms, and starting a business. It also provided money for college tuition, books, and a monthly stipend. In 1947, veterans made up of half of all the college students. Most GIs would use their money for trade schools, though, to become plumbers, electricians, and carpenters. Suburban growth. Window air conditioning units allowed more people to move to the Sun Belt states. And by 1960, when air conditioning became even more widely available, more people moved to the American South, away from it in the first time in the 100 years since the Civil War, especially in the state of Florida. 
Technological advances during this time lowered the need for manual labor on farms, which coupled with the wider availability of cars spurred the growth of suburban areas. Led by William Levitt, a New York developer, the suburban movement would draft neighborhoods within an easy drive to urban settlements. These suburbs offered affordable housing for many families, many of whom associated home ownership with the good life. The Veterans Administration Mortgage Program allowed veterans to get private loans for houses without a down payment. The Federal Housing Authority, or FHA, financed nearly 40% of all home mortgages debt between 1946 and 1950. Builders created huge suburban housing developments and similar homes that were built like in assembly line fashion in a brief period of time. In Shelley V. Kramer, racial and ethnic prejudice led to the restrictions that undermined the racial diversity of suburban communities. Despite the 1948 Supreme Court ruling in Shelley v. Kramer that housing restrictions based on race were illegal, African Americans were excluded from the new housing tracts and segregation in deteriorating urban ghettos. People of color are on the move. African-American families, such as the New Jersey-bound family pictured here, moved to the northern urban cities in droves following the end of the Second World War. Larger than the migration of African-Americans after World War I, the movement of African-Americans after World War II involved more than five million people. Many of those who moved north to find jobs only found heartache, as they were thoroughly unprepared for the demands of the availability of work or the unscrupulousness of their landlords. By 1960, more African Americans lived in cities than in rural areas for the first time in American history. Organizations such as the NAACP, the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, and National Urban League sought to confront racial discrimination and inequality. Mexican and Puerto Rican immigrants also moved around the country. The World War II Bracero program allowed Mexicans to work in the United States as migrant farm workers was renewed. And the number of Americans of Mexican and Puerto Rico and other Latinos descent as also grew. Shifting women's roles. For the first time in history by the mid-1950s, salaried women workers outnumbered hourly wage earners. Big businesses had grown larger during World War II as the government had relaxed antitrust enforcement to provide for the war effort. After the war ended, most women were encouraged or forced to quit their job as they had taken to allow the men whom they had replaced to return to work. Women tended to stay at home in large numbers during the 1950s. Their share of new college degrees and professional jobs fell. The number of employed women reached new highs. The return of 12 million veterans to private life led the creation of the post-war baby boom, which reached its peak in 1957. In the 1950s, family life departed from historic patterns. Children finished high school and young adults married right after graduating high school. Children spending more time on the streets than with their families. And invented in 1927, the iron lung was a respirator that sustained life for thousands of polio victims whose breathing was paralyzed by the disease, and there was a major polio outbreak in the 1950s. Polio is primarily was a disease that affects the nervous tissue. An effective vaccine for polio was developed in 1955 by Jonas Salk. A Religious Nation Church going was advocated as an antidote for communism. Regular church attendance in synagogues rose from 48% of the population in 1940 to 63% in 1960. Congress created new religious connection, adding under God to the Pledge of Allegiance and in God we trust to currency. Hollywood. The success films such as The Robe and Ben-Hur reflected a renewed public interest in organized religion. Radio and televised shows added a new dimension to religious life. The evangelist Billy Graham attracted millions to religious revivals that he held around the nation. Roman Catholic Bishop Fulton Sheen effectively used television to reach audiences estimated at 10 million a week. Norman Vincent Peale wrote The Power of Positive Thinking, and his writings urged positive thinking by combining psychology and religion. African-American churches were community institutions, 
and also religious organizations. Cracks in the Picture Window Many African-American families who migrated from the South and the Midwest became part of the marginalized population in Chicago, dependent on public housing and experiencing the North's forms of racism. Many critics of post-war life attacked the complacency and conformity that most Americans seem to have adopted. Some argued that the cookie-cutter approach to building houses in the suburbs was indicative of this problem. Poverty continued in many Americans' pursuit of the American dream and economic stability. Despite the prosperity of the decade, nearly one-fourth of white Americans and half of African Americans still lived in poverty. After World War II, non-white minorities moved in the greatest numbers from rural areas to cities in search of better economic opportunities. In the same period, middle-class white families moved to the suburbs. The loss of middle class hurt cities economically because they had a large tax base. Politically, the cities lost representation in state legislatures and the national government, and the low income inner cities developed with high crime and inadequate services. The governments would build public housing and try to renew the downtown area, but not with a lot of success. Literature. Some Americans begin to question conformity. James Jones from, in his From Here to Eternity, Ralph Ellison, The Invisible Man, John Updike, Rabbit Run, and J.G. Salinger's Kitcher in the Rye were several books that criticized the conformist culture and the rampant consumer culture. John Keats wrote in The Crack of the Picture Window, dismissed residential developments. The Beats. In 1948, Carroll wrote, introduced the phrase beat generation, generalizing from the social circle to characterize the underground anti-conformist youth gathering in New York's Greenwich Village at the time. On the Road was his 1957 novel by the American writer Jack Kravik, based on the travels of him and his friends across the United States. It is considered a defining work of the post-war beat and counterculture generations, with its protagonists living life against a background of jazz, poetry, and drug use. They were nonconformists and cared little for material goods. A group of popular, if controversial, writers, poets, painters, and musicians were known as beats or beatniks and were more interested in transforming themselves than transforming societies. Ballers were referred to as beats and beatniks adopted the hip language of jazz musicians. They read their poetry in coffee houses. And one of the key beliefs and practices of the beat generation was free love and sexual liberation. The original members of the beat generation used a number of different drugs, including alcohol, marijuana, benzodrine, morphine, and later psychologic drugs such as peyote and LSD. Rock and roll. As children of the baby boom reached adolescence, a distinctive subculture emerged, with consumers ranging from hula hoops to transistor radios to surfboards to rock and roll. These teenagers did not know about economic turmoil. They had been born in the post-war consumer culture. However, underneath this prosperity, there would also rise in juvenile delinquency. And over one million teens were arrested every year by 1956. The teenage children in the middle-class America made rock and roll a thriving industry in the 1950s, and Elvis its first superstar. The strong beat of the music, combined with electric guitar and its signature instrument, produced a distinctive new sound. Rock and roll was viewed as forms of expression and rebellion, and the term rock and roll was invented by Alan Freed, the man you see pictured to the right, a radio disc jockey from Cleveland, Ohio, hence that's why the Rock and Roll Hall of, Hall of Fame is in Cleveland, Ohio, was a mixture of traditional rhythms and blues. Singers and groups such as The Platters, Ray Charles, Little Richard, Chuck Berry, Richie Valens, and of course, the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, soared at the charts with their mixture of swing and rhythm and blues music. The next six slides that will follow will give you a taste of these very few stars. So enjoy. You'll have to click on and you'll hear the platters. They came up with more of a doo-wop style. Ray Charles, 
a blind pianist who mixed rhythms blues and also a little bit of country music as well. Little Richard, who was another piano player and hot rock and roll star. His music sometimes sounded a little bit, in that times, uh, controversial as it too uh, much of talking about some sexual innuendo. Strange is that when Pat Boone, a nice, polite, white singer, sang the same exact songs, that didn't seem to be a problem. Chuck Berry. It said that Chuck Berry just turned up the amplifier for his guitar, and he's the one that really created rock and roll. He would also have a major influence on major guitarists that would come later on, especially in the 1960s, such as Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, Keith Richards, and a host of others. He had a lot of great hits, like Johnny B. Good, and even wrote Surfing USA, something that was stolen by the Beach Boys. Richie Valens was a young Mexican-American singer and songwriter, and he uh, made the first hit that was not in, in the English language, La Bamba, that reached to number one. Tragically, Richie Valens, The Big Bopper, and Buddy Holly all would die on the plane called The American Pie. They were the first rock and roll stars to die tragically. And finally, Elvis Presley, known as the king of rock and roll. He's the one that was able to really transition a lot of the back form of the music that was very acceptable to white kids. His hair was actually blonde, but he dyed it black in order to give him a more of a distinctive edge. He would also be in a number of Hollywood production and movies. The Civil Rights Movement. An Alabama motel you see pictured here offers its whites patrons chilled water from a cooler, while its African-American guests must use a simple drinking fountain, labeled colored. When Ike entered the White House, he was committed to civil rights in principle and worked to expand opportunities for minorities in federal agencies. In 1953, he appointed Earl Warren as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and Warren would be instrumental during the civil rights movement. Since the 1930s, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People had worked to overturn the separate but equal separation rule established in Plessy v. Ferguson. In 1950, the Sweat v. Painter, the Supreme Court of the United States, ruled that this rule was not followed at the University of Texas and ordered the state to remedy it to allow African Americans to attend the university. The Brown Decision a 25-year legal campaign to end segregation culminated in the 1954 Supreme Court ruling in Brown v. the Board of Education of Topeka that declared school segregation unconstitutional. Linda Brown, whose family lived close to a white school, was forced to attend a segregated black elementary school. The case of Brown and the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas, was the culmination of actually several other districts state schools being sued in the court for violation of the 14th Amendment. The interesting part of the Brown case was that, ironically, the black and white schools in Topeka were inherently separate and equal. Because they were equal is the reason the NAACP chose to represent the case. If Linda Brown was not allowed to attend the white school, therefore the only conclusion could be that it was because of the color of her skin. And this would be a violation of equal protection under the law. The Supreme Court ruled that the separate but equal outlined in Plessy v. Ferguson was inherently unequal in education. And such inequality led to feelings of inferiority among African-American children. The court's decision asserted that racial integration of schools should happen with all deliberate speed. The Eisenhower administration was reluctant to force the integration. White Southerners response. Eisenhower recognized that both white leaders and many white Southerners would vehemently defend segregation and worried that forcing the process would increase hostility and violence. As he would say, it is easier to chain men's minds than their hearts. The Ku Klux Klan and other racist organizations including new middle-class citizens councils gained membership. 
To some degree, it became difficult for white Southern politicians and business owners to succeed without joining a Citizens Council. Three Southern Democrats, including Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson, were the only Southern congressmen who refused to sign the Declaration of Constitutional Principles, known as the Southern Manifesto, that asserted that the Supreme Court and other judicial activism had increased tensions and hostility in the South by their decision that sought to integrate society. Montgomery Bus Boycott Many Southern cities had ordinances that required African Americans to be seated at the back of all public buses. On December 1, 1955, Rosa Parks, a seamstress, refused to give up her seat in the colored section of the bus to a white man and moved to the back of the bus and was arrested. African Americans in Montgomery, Alabama, organized a boycott the next night, led by Martin Luther King Jr. of Atlanta. The boycott would last 381 days, and a year later, the protesters would win a case. On November 13, 1956, the United States Supreme Court ordered the state of Alabama to desegregate all public buses. This ruling was upheld in a lower court ruling known as Browder v. Gale. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would seek to promote civil rights through nonviolent resistance. King drew his ideas from his teachings of Henry David Thoreau, who went to jail for not filing to pay his income taxes that would support the war with Mexico. Mahatma Gandhi, which you see pictured behind Dr. King there in the photograph, who was able to get the British Empire to leave his native India through peaceful protests, boycotts, and hunger strikes. And of course, being a Christian minister, Jesus of Nazareth, through love thy neighbor and turn the other cheek and A. Philip Randolph. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the SCLC, was an organization led by Dr. King and sought to move beyond the perceived over-reliance by the NAACP on the court system. They promoted direct action, underscored by non-violent civil disobedience, to conform racism and segregation. Civil Rights Acts. On August 29, 1957, the United States Congress symbolically acknowledged that the U.S. government had some responsibility for the rights of black citizens. It prohibited discrimination in public places and it created the Civil Rights Commission and the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department. It strengthened the efforts of blacks to register and to vote. Senator Strom Thurmond of South Carolina filibustered a record 24 hours and 27 minutes to block it. Ike's view, the act was difficult to enforce because of the language that was in it, and he was disappointed in not being able to produce a better piece of legislation. He would say, I wanted a much stronger civil rights bill in 57 than I could get. He later lamented, but the Democrats wouldn't let me have it. Liberals criticized Eisenhower for getting such a modest bill at the end of the day, but the leader of the Senate, Senator Lyndon Baines Johnson from Texas, argued that it was historically important because it was the first civil rights bill to pass Congress since 1875. According to presidential historian Doris Kearns Godwin, Senator Johnson said, and I quote, these Negroes, they're getting pretty uppity these days, and that's a problem for us, since they got something now they never had before, the political pull to back up their uppityness. Now we got to do something about this. We got to give them a little something just enough to quiet them down, not enough to make a difference. For if we don't move at all, then the Allies will line up against us and there will be no way of stopping them. In other words, what Johnson was afraid of is that African Americans who, after the New Deal, had now voted overwhelmingly for the Democrats, might change and switch parties and vote for the Republicans again. Desegregation in Little Rock. Arkansas in 1957. Within a year, more than 500 school districts desegregated. In 1948, Arkansas had become the first Southern state to actually admit African Americans into state universities. But 1957, Governor Orville Faubus ordered the Arkansas National Guard to block nine black students from entering Little Rock Central High School. When a confrontation turned violent, Ike sent in 1,000 soldiers from the famed 101st Airborne Division to protect the students. They would remain there all year. In 
Here you see a picture of Elizabeth Eckford faced an angry mob by the Little Rock Nine, as they were called, when enter Central High School in Little Rock, Arkansas. Foreign policy in the 1950s. When Ike entered the White House, the Korean War peace talks were at a stalemate. In order to bring the North Koreans to the table, he ordered an increase in aerial bombardments. Ike also threatened to use nuclear weapons if a truce were not forthcoming. Other factors were China's rising military losses and the death of Joseph Stalin. Negotiations soon commenced after the armistice was signed in 1953. Afterwards, the United States would establish military bases around the world. Eisenhower's Secretary of State was John Foster Dulles. He believed that the containment theory of the Truman administration was needlessly defensive and desired the United States to shift toward removing the Soviet presence in Eastern Europe. Dulles promoted a policy known as brinkmanship, in which the United States would be willing to go to the brink of nuclear war in order to confront communism. The Eisenhower administration doctrine of massive retaliation controlled military spending, but stressed the use of nuclear weapons in the Soviets' attack on Western Europe going to the brink, hence brinkmanship. School children in the 1950s regularly practiced uh, these warnings. They were most of them file into the interior hallways, crouch around the walls, and also cover their heads and their jackets as to protect them against flying glass under their desk. If they saw the blinding flash of an atomic explosion without warning, they were to duck and cover under their school desk. Foreign interventionists, the CIA's foreign interventions. The CIA was concerned over the regimes of some newly independent nations following World War II and caused Ike to involve the Central Intelligence Agency in toppling unfriendly governments. These actions would illustrate that the United States had finally cast off its isolationist stance and had become fully involved in the escalating Cold War. In May of 1951, the Iranian parliament seized control of Britain's run oil industry. Mohammad Mossada cut diplomatic ties with Great Britain and insisted that Iran should only sell and profit from their own oil. Dulles was afraid that Iran was falling under communist control, so the CIA and British intelligence MI6 launched Operation Ajax to remove Mohammad Mossadegh, which they were successful. The United States government provided massive support for the Shah of Iran, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. There would be a covert operations also in Guatemala, forcing Colonel Arbenz Guzman into exile into Mexico. Indochina. In the early 1950s, most of the British colonies in Asia were either independent or about to become independent. However, the French in Indochina and the Dutch in Indonesia also had colonies there and were not willing to grant the status and resisted all efforts. One such area was French Indochina, which was composed of modern-day Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. Vietnam's communist forces leader was Ho Chi Minh, he and his forces worked to overthrow the French there, and at the Battle of Dien Phin Phu, they are able to track the French forces. Much like Germany and Korea, the country of Vietnam was divided between a communist North and a free South. The free South would be supported by the United States. In the Geneva Accords, representatives from France, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, the People's Republic of China, and the Viet Minh signed the accords which also gave Laos and Cambodia their independence and divided Vietnam along the 17th parallel. The Viet Minh communists were given control of the north and the French remaining south of the line until nationwide elections were held in 1956. In South Vietnam, Ngo Dinh Diem, a Catholic nationalist, became the new president and was very autocratic. And by 1957, communist guerrillas known as the Viet Cong were launching attacks on Diem's government. The Domino Theory Eisenhower outlined his administration's falling domino theory, which used the analogy of dominoes set up next to each other, to discuss the tendency of one nation after another to fall to communism once one in the region did. The fear of a number of Americans was that the USSR was directing the communist movements throughout the world and causing the worry that every pro-communist insurgency would lead to increased USSR and communist control of the world. 
The South East Asian Treaty Organization, or CETO, was delivered on 8 September 1954. It was very similar to NATO, but only weaker. There was no joint military command like NATO. Most important, members resided outside the region. Signatories in Manila of countries such as Australia, Britain, France, New Zealand, Pakistan, Philippines, Thailand, and the U.S. pledged joint action against aggression upon any member nation. On February 1, 1955, it was ratified by the U.S. Senate. In a separate action, the signatories of CETO pledged to support and aid South Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, who were excluded by the Geneva Agreements from entering into a separate military alliance. Re-election and foreign crisis. Democrats nominated Adelaide E. Stevenson again on the first ballot and Senator Estes Kefauver of Tennessee as vice president. Kefauver narrowly defeated JFK for vice president's nomination. Republicans renominated Eisenhower and Nixon. During the campaign, Democrats asserted the right of all citizens to equal educational opportunities favored public over private development of water power and supported 90 to 100 percent parity payments to farmers. Republicans approved the Supreme Court's order to progressively eliminate segregation and advocated partnership between federal and state agencies and private enterprise to develop water power and supported flexible parity payments. Stevens proposed an international bomb ban on the hydrogen bomb testing. And although the later stages of the campaign were marred by the Suez crisis and the beginning of trouble in Hungary, they made little difference at the polls. When Stevenson lost, they asked his reaction. He says, well, I'm too old to cry and it hurts too much to laugh. Repression in Hungary. When Stalin died in 1953, the new premier of the Soviet Union was Nikita Khrushchev. As premier, he planned to lessen Stalin's policy of control over the satellite nations and allow some independence. Hungarian leader Imre Nagy announced that he was taking Hungary out of the Warsaw Pact in 1956. The result was an invasion by Soviet forces and Nagy's overthrow. The Soviet Union used military force to suppress the uprising in Hungary in 1956 and it is estimated that 3,000 Hungarians were killed during the uprising. Another 12,000 were arrested and imprisoned. Of these, between 400 and 450 were executed. An estimated 200,000 people managed to escape to the West, to escape communism. The Suez War. The most fateful development in the Middle East involved the ownership of the Suez Canal, which connects the Red Sea to the Mediterranean Sea. The canal was owned and operated by a private company, by which, by 1950, Britain had become the company's largest shareholder. Gamal Nassar, in 1952, Egyptian king Farouk was overthrown by Nassar's army, with Nassar emerging as the, the ruler. After the establishment of Israel, however, the Arab states looked to Nassar to refuse canal usage to Israeli ships and the United Nations Security Council ordered ending the illegal ban in 1950, but Egypt refused. On July 26, 1956, Nassar seized the physical plant of the Suez Canal Company, expelling company officials and nationalizing the canal. With a promise of support by Khrushchev, Nassar did not negotiate with the British and the French. And on October 29, 1956, Israel moved against Egypt in the Sinai Peninsula and defeated 45,000 Egyptian soldiers, reaching the canal in four days. On October 30th, Britain and France issued an ultimatum for both sides to move away from the canal, which of course Egypt did not, as expected, which gave the French and the British an excuse to invade under the guise of saving the canal. Nasser blocked the canal by sinking ships. Russia denounced the French and the British and threatened to drop bombs on both and called for an immediate cease fire. The United States did not support its NATO allies, whom it felt had acted without good sense and had failed to get the advice of the United States and backed an Asian-African UN resolution for an immediate cease fire. Britain and France backed down in the face of a mounting world opinion. On October 4, 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, the first satellite, into orbit. 
although it's little more than a radio transmitter. Americans were, tra were shocked to see the advances of the Soviet space program and feared that soon space would become a war zone. The United States would respond by increasing in spending on new intercontinental ballistic missiles. NATO members would soon request missiles from the United States to defend themselves, and the National Aeronautic and Space Agency, NASA, would be established. American schools placed stronger emphasis on math and science courses, stimulating the passage of the National Defense Education Act to expand college and postgraduate education. It also meant that the new National Aeronautics and Space Administration took over the satellite program. The Eisenhower Doctrine. On January 5, 1957, before a joint session of Congress, Ike asked for the authority to extend economic and military aid to any Middle Eastern nation who requested it. It even armed, even armed forces it deemed necessary from the president's control by international communism. Ike promised an hourly communication with Congress when used. Its use would be in accordance to the U.S. Treaty Obligation and the U.N. Charter. In 1958, Congress approved of the Eisenhower Doctrine and the creation of the United Arab Republic, the overthrow of a pro-Western regime in Iraq, and an appeal to send forces to Lebanon to support tottering governments there all marked this time period. To fill the leadership vacuum into the Middle East, Berlin was still divided, and it had been after World War II. Khrushchev was losing thousands of East Berliners to West Berlin and requested a summit in 1960 to discuss the Berlin issue. The planned summit took a turn for the worse when a United States spy plane, a U-2, was shot down over the Soviet Union, when the supposedly unmanned plane was revealed to have been piloted by Francis Gary Powers. Eisenhower took full responsibility but refused to repudiate the flight. Thus, the summit would end. Communist Cuba. Castro would become Cuba's communist premier in 1959 after overthrowing the Batista regime. Fidel Castro's communist forces defeated the Cuban dictator Fulgencio Batista after two years of fighting in 1959. Originally, Americans hoped that Castro would reform the government, but soon those hopes were dashed. He instead nationalized all foreign-owned property, of which the majority was American, and redistributed the land. In 1960, Castro signed a trade agreement with the USSR, and by October 1960, the United States reacted to those actions and stopped importing Cuban sugar and placed an embargo on the most exports to Cuba and declared that it would defend its naval base at Guantanamo Bay. Evaluating the Eisenhower Presidency During Ike's second term, Alaska and Hawaii were added to the Union. The nation also entered a brief economic slump, but soon rebounded. Many historians at first viewed Ike's presidency as accomplishing very little, but recent scholarship has shed light on his policy's long-lasting effects. His desire to avoid divisive issues led him at times be value harmony and popularity over justice, and one of his greatest decisions was to avoid war. After a truce in Korea, not a single American soldier died in combat during his eight years as president, something no president has achieved since. Eisenhower would not address social racial problems, but he did balance the budget and kept inflation to the minimum. In his January 17, 1961 farewell address, he warned the nation of the dangers of the military-industrial complex, asserting on its influence in the Congress and the White House. What is ironic about the statement, as the majority of historians do not address, is that the impact of his defense budget on the domestic economy was greatest during his administration than any administration that would follow him. And so concludes our study of the 1950s and the Eisenhower administration.